Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to be here. I have for a long, long time heard about Long Hollow and uh, have never been able to preach here. I've attended one service here before, but I've grown up around so many people uh, who have called this home. I knew Pastor David before he went to heaven. Uh, I grew up around Chris Swain, for those of you who know who Swain, and uh, Brian Mills, also Brian Mills. And uh, man, so I've just known about this place for so long and uh, then became friends with Robbie, just kind of in a casual manner. Uh, until God brought Robbie to Arkansas last May. And I remember, I think he told you about the revival that took place in Arkansas. Well, I'm the guy on the other side of that, okay? I'm the guy at that church. And so I'm really honored to get to be here. And uh, thank you to Robbie and uh, Candy for the opportunity to be here. Man, don't ever neglect to recognize the gift that you have in Pastor Robbie. He's a man of God. And I know doing such a great, great job here to, uh, as he leads this place. I brought Luke Harper, uh, the prodigal son, with me back to uh, Long Hollow. Uh, Luke spent his high school years at Long Hollow here and now serves as our college pastor there in Arkansas. So, uh, I, yes, I am from Arkansas. As, uh, as Colin said, we, we don't make everybody wear the Walmart greeter things. But we do have teeth and we do wear shoes, okay? Common to people may not understand that. You know what we say in Arkansas? Thank God for Mississippi, right? Anybody? <laughs> Any Mississippi people? Okay, I apologize. Any Arkansas people in the house today, by the way? Come on now. That's what I'm talking about. You're an Arkansan and you're at the 8 a.m. You are the best, okay? By the way, we have an 8 a.m. Uh, at, our serv- at our church as well. I recognize that the 8 o'clock people are the godliest people in the church. Don't you agree with that? You are the godliest, so thanks for being here. Uh, Early, 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 making room for everybody else here. Uh, I brought a picture of my family. I'm married to Meredith. She's a Floridian. And uh, then we have four kids. This was us uh, just a week or so ago at our July 4th thing as a church. And uh, so four kids, a wife, and a busy, busy time. And uh, they are giving me up for you. And I'm glad to be here today to open up the Word of God. If you've got a Bible, let's grab it. Psalm chapter 22 is where we're going to be today. Psalm 22, and I want to talk to you about something uh, that some of you are right in the thick of this moment, and uh, if you're not in this moment now, I just want to just like prepare you that you will be at some point in your life. Uh, Probably all of us have been here at some level at some point, but some of you, like I said, are right there in the thick of it. Today, I want to talk to you about when God seems silent, when God seems silent. There are some of you who walked into church today with a very real awareness of what it feels like to walk through a season where you're praying to God, but he doesn't seem to answer. You are uh, crying out to God in prayer, but it seems like he is nowhere near. You are begging for God to move, but he doesn't seem to move. Everybody understand what I'm talking about here? Uh, You deal with what I call a perceived inactivity of God. And I say that, that in, in intentionally, a perceived inactivity, because God is always moving, but sometimes it just doesn't feel like that. Can I just say that out loud in church today? Sometimes it does not feel like God is moving. And so what in the world do we do when we walk through seasons where it seems like God is silent? Because in all reality, this has the, the ability to shake you to rattle you spiritually, rattle you emotionally, even physically at times. And uh, when God seems silent, you begin to ask questions that you maybe have never asked before. You begin to doubt things like, is God really actually even good? And is God going to come through in my situation? You, you, you ask the questions, why has God allowed certain things to happen to my life or certain things to happen in my family? Why didn't he stop these things? And sometimes you can just take a step back and look at the circumstances that you've endured and think, man, this is just horrible. This is just, it's just bad. It's just devastating, maybe even unfair. Raise your hand if you've ever been at this place before with God. Okay, all over the room, right? We all have experienced the silence of God. And if you're not careful, this will shake you to the core. And you'll find that, that within you rises fear, uh, maybe even unbelief. Well, if God didn't, didn't move the way that I thought he should move there, why would he move in my life the way that I think that he should move? Or if, if God didn't heal that person, why would I expect God to heal me? And, and for some of you, this is the backdrop of the story of your life. Um, You are maybe right here today in the midst of a season where God just doesn't seem to be speaking. 
And so what in the world are you supposed to do as a follower of Christ in that? Well, that's where we hit Psalm chapter 22. It's an incredibly honest account of a man who is suffering, uh, who is scared to death, and he has no idea where God is, okay? We're reading about David today, and, uh, and David's life here is much like our life. If you were to chart your own emotions, or maybe even chart your spiritual life during a season when God seems silent, uh, most likely the chart would not go like this, just steady. It's often kind of like this. You go up and down, up and down, up and down. And uh, that's what you're going to see in the life of David here. That he's, he's at a good place and he gets to a dark place. He gets to a good place and he's at a dark place. And it's just kind of an up and down, almost like a heartbeat on a machine. And, uh, and so I just want to walk through Psalm 22 today. I'm going to prepare you ahead of time as we get started here. We're going to lead a, read a lot of scripture in Psalm 22. Is that okay today at the eight o'clock? Y'all all right with a lot of scripture today? Okay, I just want to give you a heads up. As we get started here, we're going to cover a lot of this, even though I'll skip around uh, a little bit. Um, here's a good way to think about Psalm 22. Uh, when, you, when you were a kid, here we are right here in the, in the heat of summer. I don't know about here, but it has been hot as blazes in Arkansas this summer. But as a kid, did you ever try to burn an ant with a magnifying glass? Surely nobody here, right? But but I remember trying that. I could take you to the house that I grew up in, and I remember sitting in a specific place in the backyard trying to burn an ant to, to no avail. It never worked for me. But if you think about what a, what a magnifying glass does, it enlarges the thing that you're looking at. And in the case of trying to burn an ant, it also intensifies the heat. Why do I say that in relation to Psalm 22 as we get started today? When God appears silent in your life, there is something about the silence of God that enlarges the problems in your mind and even intensifies the heat and the pressure of life that you feel under. And uh, in, in other words, I could say it this way, the silence of God feels magnified when these certain things take place. And Psalm 22 is going to give us four different things of when, when God is silent, these four things are a reality and it, and it magnifies these things in our life. So let's just walk through the passage here. Number one, the silence of God feels magnified. Number one, when you feel abandoned, when you feel abandoned. Anybody ever felt abandoned by God before? I know we're in church. I know you're at the eight o'clock service. Like I said, the godly service of all three. But if you're honest with yourself, have you ever felt abandoned by God? Look at the way that David writes it in Psalm 22, verse one and two. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Now just pause there before we even go on any further. For some of you, this, this passage immediately sounds familiar. And you remember to yourself that this is actually the, the very words that Jesus uses on the cross. And so what's interesting about Psalm 22 is that 15 different times in the New Testament, this Psalm is either quoted directly or referenced, four of those being in Matthew 27 when Jesus is actually on the cross. And so you gotta understand this about the, about the chapters, uh, Psalm 22, before we move anywhere further, this is the context that will help you understand what we're talking about today. While Psalm 22 is written by David about his own life, it is ultimately pointing to the life of Jesus and the suffering that he would uh, bestow on our behalf. So think about the life of Jesus right here um, that he echoes in Psalm 22, that he echoes on the cross. In the worst moment of suffering on this earth, listen to me, Jesus felt the silence of God. He endured physical torment beyond belief, emotional anguish that broke his heart. And here's the question that Jesus asked on the cross, Father, where in the world are you? Now, as we get started today, there are two groups in this service today. And I say this often at my own church, really in every church service that you attend, there's always two groups of people. The first group are those of you in this room who at some point in your life, by faith, you have trusted Christ. You could take me to the time, the place where you trusted Jesus, and, and you could tell me how uh, and what a difference that Christ has made in your life. You are a saved follower of Jesus. There's another group of people in the room today that if you're honest with yourself, you, you don't really know Christ. You may have done the church thing for a while. You may be a good moral person, but in all reality, your life has never been changed by the gospel of Jesus. I want you to know, right as we get started here, this about Jesus, Jesus felt the silence of God on your behalf and he suffered on a cross for you. 
And right here, he is echoing the heart of David. And the heart of David is really expressing two things that he feels are taking place between him and God. He is explaining that he feels abandoned and he feels that God is distant. David is saying, God, you have left me here and I have no idea where in the world you are. Anybody ever felt like that before? God, you've left me and I have no idea at this moment where you are. Now, moments like that are extremely difficult, right? seasons of that can be devastating. You know, it's one thing for you to come into a church service and be like, Lord, I need to hear you. And you walk out and think to yourself, man, I just really didn't feel like I hear God. It's another thing to walk through six months of the silence of God. I'll just be blunt with you. This is one of the most difficult things that you will ever face in your Christian life when you feel like God is silent. You hear about the love of God. You hear about the goodness of God. You hear about the power of God to do whatever he wants. And so what in the world do you do when he seems unloving, when when you don't see his goodness, when he does not seem near and you don't see his power on display? Lord, I'm praying, but you're not talking back. I'm reaching out, but I feel no rest. He goes on and look at verse three. This is kind of where he goes on this chart up and down, up and down. He comes back up. What? What does he say? He says, yet you are holy and thrown on the praises of Israel and you are fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them to you. They cried and were rescued and you they trusted and were not put to shame. So there's the roller coaster. He's like, God, I have no idea where you are. Yet you are holy and people in my family have trusted you for generations. It's just this up and down mentality, up and down roller coasters of emotions that we've always been on. And David right here in the passage actually gives us the way forward in the midst of silence, in the midst of times where you feel like God is not speaking, what do you do? And uh, there's a guy named David Godfrey, Robert Godfrey, who actually says it this way. He says, a recurring spiritual remedy in the Psalms is to fill the mind with memories of God's past faithfulness to assure us of his present faithfulness. So can we do a little audience participation today? Y'all good with that? Has God been faithful to you in your life? Yes or no? Okay, that was a pretty resounding yes from from the group today, all right? So if we know that God has been faithful in our lives in the past, here's what David is saying. I'm looking backward so that I can move forward. That's where some of you are today. You need to look backward into all the various instances in your life where God has been faithful in order to move forward forward. The, the silence of God feels magnified when you feel abandoned. But think about a second thing the passage teaches us. It also feels magnified when you feel criticized, when you feel criticized. Man, doesn't criticism hurt of any kind? And can I just tell you that criticism and the Christian life actually go hand in hand? Like I said, that's a terrible truth to give you this morning. Aren't you glad you came to church for that encouraging news? That criticism and the Christian life actually go hand in hand. You're, you're gonna try to be a, a godly parent and raise your child in a certain way. And there'll be other parents who will criticize you for the way that you are parenting. You may be a student of some age. You're like, man, Nick, I'm trying to live a godly life in my middle school, high school, college. I'm trying to do all that I can and I'm getting criticized. Uh, if you lead in any capacity, by the way, in any realm of life, you will be criticized. And I would just prepare you that the further the culture goes downhill, the more that you can expect as a Christian to be criticized. Again, just bringing the encouraging words from Arkansas to Tennessee for you right here this morning. Think about social media. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't social media basically bent on one thing? Criticism right? It's all about criticism. Like you could post on Instagram that you got a new puppy. The puppy's name is Snuggles. And you just say, hey, here's our new puppy as a family. His name is Snuggles. And people automatically just start commenting. Well, it must be nice to make that kind of money to buy that kind of puppy. <laughs> Next person says, well, why not a cat? Okay. Next person says, well, this is the first time I've ever seen you stand up for animal rights. Why haven't you done this? Before? And you're just like, oh my goodness, I'm just trying to pick, post a picture of Snuggles right here. All right. We all get criticized and criticism is often unfair. Think about how David expresses this. Skip down to verse six. He says, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me, mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads at me. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. They're making fun of him there. So you think David feels under it? Think about the words that he uses here. He says that I've been scorned, despised, 
and mocked. People are mocking his faith here, being like, that David, he is trusting in God to deliver him. Isn't that hilarious? This, again, echoes what would one day happen on the cross. Again, it's the life of David pointing forward to the life of Jesus here. And let me give you, uh, I don't know if it's an encouraging word, let me give you something that may help you give context when you walk through suffering or criticism of some sort, is that if Jesus suffered and was criticized, why in the world would we expect to be exempt from, from suffering and criticism, right? And uh, there was a guy in church history by the name of William Tyndale. You may have heard his name before. Uh, William Tyndale lived in England. He was the very first person. There he is. Isn't that a sweet beard? It looks kind of like Pastor Robbie, does it not? <laughs> and um, William Tyndale lived in England in a day where it was not favorable for the normal people, lay people in the church to have a copy of God's word in their own language. And so they'd come to church and it would be read in a different language and they'd sit there and be like, this makes no difference in my life. I don't know what this guy's saying up on stage. And so William Tyndale was determined to be the first one to translate the Bible from the original Hebrew and Greek into the English language for the common people, for people like us. And uh, he was under such persecution, he actually had to leave England to do this. And for 12 years, worked in secret, translating the Bible until one day he was found and arrested and he was ultimately put to death. And think about how they put, the, put him to death. They strangled him, then they burned his body, and then they blew up his body with gunpowder. Now, that's, that's quite the way to go, is it not? And so here's, here's a question that I just want to throw out to you because I think it's a, good, uh, it's a good illustration of today's message, all right? Surely, Tyndale was criticized in his day for doing a good thing. We would look at him hundreds of years later now, and we would say, God, where in the world were you at that? I mean, here's a guy who left his home country and went and hid in secret for 12 years, translating the scriptures for us, like for people like us. And Lord, why in the world would you allow that guy to be criticized? And why in the world would you allow that guy to suffer when he was doing a good thing for you? History tells us that as he was being strangled, he, he cried out one last prayer, and it was this, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And with that, he died. Two years later, the king of England set out an edict that every church in England had to have a copy of an English Bible in the church. You see, sometimes God is writing a story that we can't see and would never know. His silence and his inaction is a part of a bigger story. So can I speak to you about your own life today? I'm not your pastor, but can I pastor you for a moment while, while Robbie's gone? Sometimes God is writing a story that you can't see and you would never know. And his inaction at times in your life, his silence at times in your life is a part of a bigger story story. See, the silence of God feels magnified when you feel abandoned, maybe when you feel criticized, but look at where the passage goes next. When you feel surrounded, you ever feel surrounded by people? Here's what happens. Look, at, look down uh, all the way at verse 13, or excuse me, verse 11. David cries, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there's none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open their wide, their, uh, wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. Skip down. He says, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Now, again, you see that last little phrase there of verse 18. Again, what's that pointing to? Jesus on the cross yet again. Now you may be wondering here as he speaks about bulls and ravenous bulls and, and lions and dogs, like what in the world is he speaking about here? He is referencing cruel enemies who like an animal desire to tear you apart. 
Even one scholar pointed the idea of, of, uh, of dogs in the day of Bible times uh, were not like snuggles, not like the puppy that you would have in your home. They were much more like scavengers who would come and just scavenge meat that was left behind. And so here's what David is saying. Lord, I am almost dead. These people are surrounding me. They are trying to, to tear me apart like an animal and you are nowhere to be found. You see, what we find here in the words of David is something that all of us know, man, people are tough at sometimes. Sometimes people are wicked. You ever been around wicked people? Somebody like, yeah, I actually brought them to church with me today, right here, okay? And sometimes people are just, just very, very mean. There's something about when you feel surrounded. There's something about when other people are piling on that, man, the silence of God feels magnified. And it's just very difficult. This can happen even in a spiritual setting like church. This can happen at your work life and your career. This can happen in a family setting, which is very, very difficult. And when this happens, you just sit back and wonder yourself, Lord, where in the world are you? Like, I just don't know where you are. Look at the language that he uses throughout these verses. He, he says, man, they are encompassing me. They're surrounding me. They're in, encircling me. It is terrifying when you feel like this. Anybody ever been there before? I mean, I just feel like everybody's surrounding me. Everybody's against me, that they're, they're surrounding me and encompassing me like nobody has my back. And all the while, you're just wondering, where is the Lord in this? Fourth thing we see here in this passage is that the silence of God feels magnified when you feel empty. When you feel empty. Have you ever felt empty? You ever felt empty spiritually? Oh, that's something we, we church people don't really like to admit, but maybe you've walked into church feeling empty today. Look, look at the words of David. Skip down to verse 14. He says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of Death. Can we all agree this is a low point for David? I mean, he is at the bottom. He has hit rock bottom and he is empty. Let me speak to you today if you're here because I, I just feel like I need to give you some advice if you find yourself relating with what David is speaking about right here. If you, if you walk in today and you're like, Nick, I am, I am that right here. I am completely empty empty. This thing has gone on too long. This, this trial we're in has been happening so long that, man, I am so desperate for God to move that I'm no longer desperate, if that makes sense. Like, I have been in this so long, I feel numb, I feel tired, I feel empty. All I want to do is take a nap right now. Can I just warn you and give you a caution if you are in that place today? Here's what I tell you. Um, you're not going to think clearly today. You're not going to be able to withstand sin like you normally would. Everything is going to be magnified in your life when you feel spiritually empty. And part of spiritual maturity is learning when you get to that place, because here's the reality. We all get to that place. And here's the reality, man, when you can stop and say, okay, I'm not at a good place personally. I'm at an empty, weak place personally, so I need to adjust accordingly. I had a mentor one time that I worked for who, who he said, Nick, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Isn't that a godly word of advice right there? How many of you plan on being a godly person today and just taking a good old Sunday afternoon nap? Like, I'm going to be napping on that plane on the way back to Arkansas, I guarantee you. Take this in my own life. Sunday nights after I get done preaching is usually when I'm the most empty, the most vulnerable, the most uh, susceptible to temptation. When is that in your own life? Are you at an empty place today? What you do next is really, really critical, okay? So those are four things we've seen. The man, the, the, the silence of God feels magnified. It, it just feels like horrible when I feel abandoned, when I feel criticized, when, when I'm walking through stuff like, like we just talked about, when I'm walking through periods of emptiness. And so here's the question of the day, okay? We've kind of diagnosed the problem, but what in the world do you do when you feel the silence of God? Some of you are at this place today, you're like, Nick, I don't really know how to operate. I'm not sure what to do. I'm at the place that you're talking about right now. It is like there is a spotlight on my head as you were speaking this morning. So what in the world am I supposed to do? Well, maybe you do feel abandoned, criticized, surrounded, empty, whatever. Here's what David did. Look down at verse 22. This is really the turning point in the passage. 
He says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. So in the midst of all the people, I will praise the Lord. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him. Look what the scripture says, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. You see, that was a turning point. We've seen so far in the passage, everybody, everybody look up here. We've seen in the passage so far, his emotions go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And finally, it's just like he puts his foot in the ground and says, but in the midst of all that, I'm going to praise the Lord. And in the midst of all that, here's what David is saying. I have confidence that even when I feel like God is not speaking, when he is not moving, I know that God has heard me. You realize you, you can you not talk and still listen? By the way, husbands, we're all experts at that, but aren't we not? You can hear and, and not talk. And so here's, God sent me all the way from Arkansas to just tell you this. God hears when you cry out. In your moments of desperation, lying awake in bed at night, and you wonder where in the world God is. You wonder why in the world is God not moving in my situation? Why is God not moving in my life? God hears you. That's the confidence of today. And so here's what I tell you. Um, you don't have to understand all things to praise the Lord. You don't have to know the future to praise the Lord. You don't have to have all of your whys answered to praise the Lord. You don't have to be on the other side to praise the Lord. Did you hear that? You don't have to be done with the trial. You don't have to be done with the suffering to praise the Lord. The only thing that you have to have to praise the Lord is the heart and the will and the mouth to praise the Lord. Like that's the word of God for you today right there. I, uh, I find it very interesting with this, with this all close. I find it very interesting just as, as you think about how the Psalms are ordered. And you may have never heard this before, but, but Psalm 22, 23, and 24, uh, they're linked together and they're often called the shepherd's Psalms. J. Vernon McGee once said it this way. He says, you got to know Jesus the, uh, Jesus the Savior in Psalm 22 before you can know Jesus the shepherd in Psalm 23. I, I, just, uh, I just find it really interesting that Psalm 22 is just a feeling of total abandonment, abandonment by God, right? I mean, David has just been low, 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 low. Where is God? Where is God? I cry by day. You do not hear. You do not answer and then he closes Psalm 22 with praising God. And then you get to Psalm 23. Can I remind you of what Psalm 23 says? I'll just read it to you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still water. So many needs the 23rd Psalm today in your life. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Let the word of God minister to your heart here. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Something shifted in the mind and in the heart of David and in the Psalms after he praised the Lord in the midst of his suffering. Isn't that interesting? Like out of all the things that, that could have come right after Psalm 22, he speaks about the loving, gracious care of the shepherd. 
And so I just want you to understand this today. If you were to say, well, Nick, what is waiting on the other side of my praise this morning? That, it, that as I'm in the midst of suffering, that I, as I'm in the midst of the silence of God, as I'm in the midst of a place that I do not want to be, what is waiting on the other side of my praising God? Here's what's waiting on the other side. Peace, right thinking, faith and joy. Here's a good one. Context. More than anything, you know what awaits, awaits you on the other side of your praise this morning? A good, good shepherd who's just ready for you to just come back to where you need to be with him. And uh, David ultimately ends up at the place at the end of Psalm 22 of saying this, man, that in the midst of all of this, in the midst of me feeling criticized and abandoned by God and surrounded by people, in the midst of all this stuff, I'm going to praise the Lord. And I find it very interesting. He says, it's not that I'm going to do that alone. He says, in the midst of the congregation, in the midst of the people of God, I will praise the Lord. I wonder who here today is in the middle of a season of silence. You find yourself at a place where you're like, Nick, I have no idea why it is that God has not answered my prayer. I've begged God for the prodigal, that is my son or daughter to come home, and God has not brought her home. I've begged the Lord for healing of this disease, and it has not come. Lord, I, I've cried out to you day and night for this, this thing in my career, and man, it's just keeping me up at night. And Lord, you have not answered. And, and a million other examples like those. And I wonder who here today, in the midst of the congregation, needs to praise God in the midst of that place. In just a moment, we're going to close with one final song. And I wonder who here today needs to just come and in the midst of the congregation, in the midst of the people of God, make your way to this altar and just say, Lord, I'm just coming today to just tell you that I trust you in the midst of this. I'm just coming today to just say, Lord, I trust you and I praise you in the midst of this. I wonder here today who needs to meet Jesus for the very first time told you already, Jesus endured the silence of God for you. He suffered on your behalf on a cross for a moment like this when you could hear what God has done for you in Christ and you for the very first time could turn in faith to him. Would you trust Christ today? I want us just to bow our head and close our eyes and I'm going to pray for you and then we're going to respond together. You know, one of the greatest things in your life that you could ever learn is to be responsive to the word of God. Are you responsive to the word of God in your life? I want to pray for you and then we're going to sing and let's come. Today, if you meet Christ, as soon as I get done praying over here at our next steps area to my left and your right, if you need Christ, if you need somebody to pray with you about anything in your life, why don't you go over there? They'll lead you to faith in Christ. They'll answer any question that you have. But maybe you're here today and you say, Nick, that's settled in my life, but man, I am walking through a season. And I just need to come and just tell the Lord in the midst of, of all the places I don't want to be in my life. I'm here and I'm struggling, but I just know I need to praise the Lord. I'm going to pray, and as soon as I get done praying, let's just respond. If you need to come to this altar, say, Lord, I trust you. Right here in the midst of, uh, of this battle, I trust you. Right here in the midst of your silence, I believe that you hear me, Lord. Let's respond together. Lord Jesus, we turn our eyes to you right now, and we say that in the midst of the silence, we trust you. In the midst of places we don't want to be, in circumstances we don't want to endure. God, we trust you. 
Lord, we make our way to a position of responsiveness to you with confidence that you hear us today, with confidence that you are moving even when we can't see it. So Lord, whatever the next step is we need to take right now, Lord, would you allow us to do that? It's in Jesus' name that we pray.